people who are the wealthiest, who can make the most changes in society in 50 years will all be Bitcoiners. It was to get rich before, now it's to avoid getting poor. More people will start to appreciate this ethos of buying quality things, of building quality things that last, and less of this fast fashion, constantly churning through crap. There are people now who probably don't feel inflation yet because they're super rich and they don't go to a grocery store and they don't care how much it costs. But as their wealth gets eroded away, they might start paying attention to it. You can adopt the Bitcoin standard right now and then all of a sudden inflation is actually your friend and not your enemy. This isn't greedy corporations. This isn't immigrants coming in and stealing your job. This is because they're printing incredible amounts of money every day and debasing your savings. If you had the opposite where the prices are going down by 2% every year, now it's capital's responsibility to say, hey, I know we agreed to 100,000 a year, but I actually need to lower that. And it's okay because your costs have gone down as well. Can we agree to a lower price? It flips the relationship and actually makes for more pro-labor society where the, the workers then have the inertia on their side. You can't just go around Silicon Valley with a pitch deck and a pretty face and raise $100 million. You actually have to provide value for people to jump that hurdle rate of Bitcoin. Bitcoin will bring us to true capitalism and not a weird thing where we have central banks but everyone calls it capitalism where capital itself isn't uh, free great thing about bitcoiners is we are used to having our entire frame of reference smashed uh, i will be speaking at bitcoin amsterdam uh, probably next week when i publish that uh, so we will be together on stage i'm really looking forward to that um, let's talk a little bit before we get into your topics with Rite of Passage and, and uh, living in Thailand and other things and, and Bitcoin and freedom in general. Uh, let's talk a little bit, maybe let's give a little bit of a preview of uh, what we might talk about uh, next week. Uh, and uh, for me, it's really interesting when we look at the, the topic of where Bitcoin could end up in 2050, what life we will live in in 2050, especially the, the time horizon of like the next 26 years is a very specific one for me because 26 years a lot of things can happen like most people completely overestimate what like happens in one year but they underestimate what happens in 10 years and they completely underestimate what actually could happen in uh in 25 26 years um mm -hmm. how do you look at uh bitcoin development uh in in 26 years how do you imagine that that uh have a bitcoinized uh, world and one thing that really got me excited as i went down the ra the rabbit hole uh, was actually like i used to be very into uh energy and eco friendliness and eco conscious and whatnot and then through bitcoin i sort of realized that there isn't anything wrong with that, like consuming less or, or being more conscious, but the, the ways that we are being fed that is often a narrative of control that we're not actually attacking the right problem, right? The institutions are telling us we need to drive electric cars and use solar panels and whatnot. But in a lot of ways, those aren't actually solving the problems. In some ways, they're making it much worse. The real problem to me is overconsumption of of things and the complete lack of quality, which we don't really like on the surface, you don't think of that as associated with Bitcoin. But once you're in Bitcoin long enough, you meet enough Bitcoiners, you start to realize there's a, there's a correlation between quality and, and Bitcoin and people who are interested in Bitcoin. They're interested in creating quality things that last for a long time. And I'm really excited about that, that ethos to sweep through humanity as Bitcoin grows and grows. And I think people will jump on the Bitcoin bandwagon. I think the first 10 years were about number go up. And that's why people were jumping on the bandwagon. Now I think it's more about getting out of, of debasement. It's It was to get rich before. Now it's to avoid getting poor. The people are getting into Bitcoin because they're realizing prices are going up so fast. They need to find a lifeboat and they could go gamble it in the crypto casino, but they the most surefire way is to get into Bitcoin. And I think that as more people are adopting Bitcoin, more people will start to appreciate this ethos of, of quality, of buying quality things, of building quality things that last and less of this fast fashion, constantly churning through crap. And I'm excited to buy a dishwasher that lasts for 50 years 
because that's what I remember growing up with. Like we had a washing machine from the eighties that just still worked. And now you get a washing machine and it dies in like two years because some little electronic component goes bad. And then lo and behold, there's no spare parts. There's no one who can fix it. You just got to go buy another $500 machine. So I'm excited for this return to quality that I think Bitcoin is going to usher in. And that will have, I think, in turn, lots of effects throughout society that will be extremely beneficial. I think we'll see less waste. We'll see less frivolous spending, more people focused on what really matters and what really returns to them and their families and communities, which is quality time together, building quality things, providing value to other people. And I don't know really like how I can describe how that might change the world, but it will definitely have massive effects. And I think that's something that we'll see in the next like maybe 25 to 50 years because it's kind of generational as well. Like I grew up in a fast fashion world. A lot of my peers are st that's still normal to them to buy clothes all the time and just consume, consume, consume. It's, it's totally normal to buy a new car every couple of years because the old one is just old. Uh, I think it'll take a generation for these things to kind of smooth out and get carried into the, the popular conscience. I'm also really excited about the uh, generation that is now born. Like if you think about someone that is right now in 2024 born, uh, he probably has almost no touch points, no real touch points with money the next 15 years because yeah, money is just like a really abstract uh, concept till you're like 15, 20 years old in most cases, especially because your parents take care of your bills. You don't, you, you get some pocket money, but <laughs> it, it's not really the, the real concept of like, oh, it's mm -hmm. inflationary or something like that. So when you come to a generation that will have the first touch points with money when they're like 15, 20 years old, then Bitcoin hopefully is so much developed that they actually live in a kind of a Bitcoin world. Uh, not saying fiat will be destroyed at that point, just like that Bitcoin will be very present at that point. Um, that, that is, that gives me a lot of hope that we now have a generation that might live in a, in a, in a Bitcoin focused, uh, world, a Bitcoin dominated world. Really cool. Also, one thing that, um, stood out to me, what you said is not getting poor, uh, not number go up, but, uh, not getting poor as the main driver. And I see it already now where even in Austria, where inflation is not that, uh, bad as in Turkey or in Argentina, inflation is a topic. Like people talk about it. They don't see the solution with Bitcoin. <laughs> they, they don't run to Bitcoin. And I also see in Turkey and Argentina, they rather go to like an USD stable coin. They rather go to the US dollar as the next best fiat currency uh, and not go that much to the Bitcoin. Of course, in their countries, the Bitcoin adoption is higher than in, in others. Uh, but it, it seems like they, they rather go to a not as broken fiat currency rather than going to the most broken fiat currency. Um, when, when will that sh shift come in the population? How high has the pay, pain to be the like people that are actually like, Oh yeah, like maybe I should look into, into Bitcoin. What will that, that adoption barrier, uh, break? Yeah. I don't think about this as like one barrier. I think it's all on a continuum. Like people will marginally adopt Bitcoin as they get pushed out of everything else and as everything else starts to inflate faster and faster. And I saw it going back to the US because I've been in, in Thailand since 2019, but I went back in 2022 and rode a motorcycle around the country for like three months. And that was the first time I heard people really talking about inflation. And I had gone down the Bitcoin rabbit hole before that. I understood that inflation is probably a lot higher than the 2% that were billed all the time that there's certain sectors of goods that certainly unequivocally have much higher inflation, like healthcare, for instance. And people had, had heard people complain about that in the past, like especially the U.S. healthcare system is super expensive. It's become like a, a chronic stressor of Americans. I have several friends who, hold on, I gotta kill that. Oh, good. Several friends who gave up on doing something entrepreneurial because they needed to keep their health insurance, which came with their job in the US. So they didn't want to start their own job or do what they really wanted to do because they're afraid of losing their health insurance. They get in a car crash and now they're in debt for the rest of their lives because of that medical bill. So I saw it kind of bubbling up in these different areas. But and like now for a lot of people, people blamed it on something else. And I was guilty of this too before I discovered 
Bitcoin, if those greedy corporations or whatever, somebody is, is screwing with prices until I started to really understand how money works. So I think it's going to be this gradual process where there are people at different stages of this understanding. There are people now who really don't feel inflation yet because they're super rich and they don't go to a grocery store and they don't care how much it costs. But as their wealth gets eroded away, they might start paying attention to it. Okay. Why, you know, why are there more controls on the other assets that I have? There's higher taxes in certain areas. How can I escape and, and avoid this pain? And they'll start coming to Bitcoin. I think people who are feeling it now in inflation, uh, at the grocery store, they're going to start to realize this is happening everywhere in every good and. Hopefully they'll see some touch point because of people like you and other content creators that are creating mass media content talking about this, that, hey, this isn't greedy corporations. This isn't immigrants coming in and stealing your job. This is because they're printing incredible amounts of money every day and debasing your savings. It's very clear and very simple, but people just haven't seen the right thing because, of course, the the powers that be are not going to tell you that that's, that's why it's going up. They're going to find a scapegoat for it. But more and more, it's going to get harder and harder to avoid that fact. And once you face that fact, you come upon Bitcoin, you start to understand that this is a solution. And then I think Bitcoin takes levels of trust as well. People get in because they're like, oh, wow, all my friends are buying it. I'm going to buy it now. And then they get wrecked. And then they start to understand, why did I get wrecked? And, you know, what does this thing actually do? What did I buy? And some of them get on the train. And ultimately, I think it's just a survival of the fittest thing, like the people who are the wealthiest, who can make the most changes in society in 50 years will all be Bitcoiners. So that ethos will then take over and all the people, including the ultra wealthy right now that didn't understand it, their fortunes will waste away. And so they will have a lot less energy to spend that and. I want to say like influence, but money is energy, right? So they can, you can make people do things on your behalf by paying them in Bitcoin. You can provide value to other people and get value from them. So the people that have all that stored value, they're going to have the ability to make change, to make public campaigns and whatnot. And those will all be Bitcoiners. The people who didn't buy Bitcoin, they won't have that, that power in the future. That's an interesting uh, thing when you think about a world where Bitcoin actually succeeded. And then all those people that now have Bitcoin will be kind of the, I, I don't like the word, but the new elite, the new uh, powerful people, uh, but I don't like the word. Um, and, and it could have a massive influence on, on how we, how we do things. And this is an, this is an impactful thing that I didn't even, even consider too much till now where what not only happens when Bitcoin is, is the, the main money, but what if, uh, Bitcoin, all those early Bitcoin adopters who have now this low time preference already, this critical thinking mindset, this first principles thinking, most of them at least, um, there are also exceptions in the Bitcoin community, uh, as we all know, but uh, most of them have this. It's, it's, it, it could be a, a quite cool word. One thing that um, you spoke about was also interesting for me when we talked about uh, entrepreneurs and, and, and companies. That's, I think, a, a common theme that uh, I call them finance bros <laughs> in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the traditional finance space. Always talk about, okay, but what if we actually have some money and then the hurdle rate of, of getting uh, entrepreneurial money and, and venture capital money and credits from the bank and stuff like that is really hard because uh, you can just keep your money and money actually um, appreciates over time. So your incentive is not to just invest it too much in the, uh, in, in the company. If I have a, a lot of money uh, in, in Bitcoin and it appreciates slowly over time, I don't have the incentive to, to gamble it on, on some startup. But if my money loses like 10, 20, 30, even 40 percent of value, and I have a lot of a uh, big pile of money, I have a big incentive to gamble on like 10 startups. Uh, what do you think happens when we have Bitcoin as the new hurdle rate? Um, when we have Bitcoin as like this sound money barrier, um, and maybe even the impact on like zombie companies, as I call them, companies that are just alive as, as uh, there's so much cheap money and they benefit from the credit and rent seeking. Um, what, what impact do you think uh, has it on, on, on companies and, uh, and the financial side? 
So I, I remember in economics class, we were taught about inflation in a curiously like not symmetric way. What I mean by that is we were taught that inflation, a little bit of inflation is good, 2%, 3% to push money around, to drive investment. But a lot of inflation is bad, as we know, it's hyperinflation and everything is hard to lie about that. A lot of inflation is obviously bad. But then on the deflation side, we're not taught the same thing. We're taught that as soon as you get any deflation, you have a death spiral and everything burns and the whole world disappears. And there's no discussion of like, well, is it marginal on the other end? Can we have 2% deflation? And that would be a good thing. We're just taught never, ever go to deflation. That's like entering a black hole. We have no idea what's on the other side. And, and that's just doom for an economy. And it's never really discussed again in orthodox economics. That's just taken as fact. Never, ever go to deflation. And really, you should just mirror it. Like it's all on a continuum. You don't want massive deflation. And I don't think Bitcoin would ever really provide that because of how inflation and deflation work, which I can get into my theory on that. But with a little bit of deflation and with a currency that essentially inflates a little bit, but maybe below the, the rise in productivity of the whole society, you just have prices slowly coming down. So it kind of changes the power dynamics in a couple of ways. Like I think the labor versus capital debate is a really interesting one that a lot of Bitcoiners don't talk about that you have this fight that was really big in like the seventies and eighties. My dad was in a, a strike right when he joined an airline and he's very pro labor as a result of this, this whole ex formative experience. And there was this big battle between the, the labor unions and the capitalists. Well, the reason that they have to fight is because prices are always going up because the value of that dollar they're being paid in that they're agreed to on their contract is always going down. So it's on labor's responsibility basically to fight to always get higher wages. And the way this works in big industries, they literally negotiate with the, the union negotiates with the company for like five or 10 years to get a new contract. And it's always this huge thing that's really drawn out, has a ton of politics and, and bullshit actually hurts customers in a lot of ways too, because the customer or the, the company is fighting with the, the union and back and forth. Well, if you had the opposite where let's say the, the prices are going down by 2% every year, going down by some certain amount every year. Now it's capital's responsibility to say, Hey, I know we agreed to a hundred thousand a year, but I actually need to lower that. And it's okay because your costs have gone down as well. Can we agree to a lower price? So it, it flips the relationship and actually makes for more pro labor society where the, the workers then have the, the sort of, how do I put it? Like the inertia on their side that helps them out more than helping out capitalists, in my opinion. But it also helps capitalists because they can stockpile capital and it will grow over time. So I think all these things kind of fall on this this sort of marginal um, continuum where a little bit of an, of deflation would kind of be a, a non, non issue. Like it's people still need to eat. They still want to earn more money than that. Like it won't wipe out investment to your original point about startups and investing in companies. People are not going to hoard their Bitcoin and s sit under a tin roof and eat gruel every day just to have more Bitcoin. They're still going to enjoy their life. Like all of us Bitcoiners, we're still enjoying our lives. I still go on vacations. I still own chairs. You know, there's a whole meme of like, get rid of everything, but most Bitcoiners are not like that. Most people are not like that, but it does subtly change your psychology where you're like, do I really need to buy a $500 branded backpack or am I good with a $50 utility backpack that gets the job done that I need it for? Because you're not just trying to throw money around because it's going to disappear anyway. Or do I really want to invest in Intel or Apple or Google? Is that really a company that I want to support? Or am I just trying to get out of, of my melting ice cube and put it in something that might hold its value or be a rocket ship? So I think it will just reduce this crazy investment like startups like Juicero and Theranos that were just complete scams. It will wipe those out because you can't just go around Silicon Valley with a pitch deck and a pretty face and raise a hundred million dollars. You actually have to 
provide value for people to jump that hurdle rate of Bitcoin, which might be two or four or five percent. And there will still be people who, with a portion of their capital, want to invest it because I might be sitting on a bunch of Bitcoin, but I want to go out and try to get five or 10 percent from a startup as well. I Maybe I just want to invest in them because I think it's a good idea and I want to help out a friend or family member. Like there's plenty of other reasons and and motivations for people to make money or to invest in things other than my money is losing value at two to 10% a year, which is sort of what, what the inflation believers are justifying. They're trying to say like, we need our, our money to melt so that people will give it to companies. People will still give it to companies. Yes, slightly less so. They'll be slightly smarter about who they invest in. There'll be some dumb ideas that won't get money. There'll be some good ideas, I'm sure, that won't get money as a result, but it will marginally change things. It's not like investment's going to disappear because of, of Bitcoin. I don't think that that makes any sense. There are a lot of interesting points. This could also erase those crazy boom and bust cycles uh, as we had it in the dot-com bubble uh, and, and so many other examples um, when the hurdle rate is a little bit up. Also interesting... Um, I was in stocks before then now I'm completely all in Bitcoin, but I already said at some point Bitcoin will hit the maturity level where I might want to go in with like 10, 20% of my um, capital that I'm like, oh, okay, let's, let's see if there's something really interesting in, in, the, on the company side. Maybe there's something that I want to support or maybe there's something that I see as a, a major, uh, future topic where I want to invest in. Um, right now I don't see anything close to the opportunity that Bitcoin is that probably will not change in the next like five, 10 years, maybe even like long, longer than that. But at some point uh, I'm, I'm searching for investments again uh, because Bitcoin is at the maturity level and then it makes sense to maybe take like 10, 20% or higher than that if you want uh, of your capital and, and see if there's something outside of, of Bitcoin where you can get some outsized returns or just just support something that you really want to support like there there's a lot of interesting uh, discussion around that also interesting what i found is what you said i never thought about that um what if we have a deflationary system where the employee or the, the employer all of the sudden has to negotiate with the employee to have a lower salary every year now uh, the employee has to go to the company and say like oh please i want to have a higher salary but what if the, the 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 salary is actually going down over time because purchasing power is is rising that much, and if you provide the same value, you get a, a lower salary every year. So you have to like keep up uh, with with that to get the same salary. So that's, this is an interesting uh, uh, perspective. I never saw it like that. Where then all of a sudden the companies have to go to the uh, employees and say like, oh, um, sorry, uh, we we have to negotiate a lower salary. Uh, which is a, I think, a beautiful thing, but uh, most people have a hard time probably understanding uh, why, why is that. The one thing that uh, I want to get a little bit into is also uh, why massive deflation is bad. It's I don't fully grasp it because it's like when when we have massive deflation uh, and we let's say we are on a Bitcoin standard and we have massive deflation. Doesn't that mean that uh, we are just getting really efficient with producing things and all of the things getting really cheap at, at that point just because we are getting more efficient in, I don't know, getting bananas or whatever. Uh, and in that way, Bitcoin has a solid value, but we are getting better in producing things. Uh, wouldn't that, wouldn't massive deflation be an advancement for humanity? Yeah, I guess that's true. Like if we're talking, you're, uh, we're already on a Bitcoin standard, then massive deflation is a signal for productivity gains. We're seeing huge productivity gains. I guess a more nuanced way to say it is rather than inflation and, and deflation is predictability. I think predictability is important because you have that allows for contracts. It allows for interaction between businesses and for planning in for the long term. So if you are planning to sell some good at a certain price or whatever for a long time and someone has agreed to then buy it for a long time and now the price is varying a lot, somebody's getting screwed on that, that end. But if you know predictably how prices are generally going to trend, I think that's, it's helpful for business 
planning. It's helpful for making contracts. But if you know it's, if it's, if we're on a Bitcoin standard, say, then yeah, having massive deflation is not a big deal. It's when it swings a lot, I think that then you create problems for business planning, for financial planning. Uh, makes sense. Uh, it's like the unpredictable uh, swings. It's even like within inflation, it's hard. Uh, I remember I was in my fiat job and, and we, uh, and, and I negotiated, uh, contract deals over like four or five years. Uh, and this was a, this was really like a, a hard thing to do because basically you were saying like, oh, we are, we will provide that service for the next five years and there's a dollar amount and they pay each year. <laughs> How do you know? Like what? If, if, if we can provide that, let's say, let's make the numbers easy for a hundred thousand dollars right now, this year in 2024, I don't know if I can provide the same service for a hundred thousand dollars in five years from now. Probably not, to be honest. And then how do you calculate the inflation? How do you make sure there's a contract where you still make profits in five years with that contract and it's not a huge liability? So predictability exactly. seems to be, uh, very important. Yeah, I think it would be like to the labor versus capital argument. It's would play in labor's favor to have that kind of five year, 10 year contract. But I think about like an airline, if they, they plan on rewriting a contract with pilots every five or 10 years. So let's say they write one in 2025 and we're on a Bitcoin standard. And so prices are slowly going down and they've, they've modeled out that they're going to ticket prices are going to go down by 2% every year or whatever. But suddenly there's a massive breakthrough in, in airline technology or whatever. And then, and prices come down by 50% per year. Well, that airline is going to struggle really hard or possibly go bankrupt. And now all those people who they might have been cheering, like, yeah, yeah, productivity is causing this massive dip in prices, but that, that job could be in jeopardy. That whole company could be in jeopardy if they're not able to then renegotiate the contract with their employees. So it's just the surprise element, I think, that makes long-term business planning more difficult. But like we've been saying, I think a Bitcoin standard would make those kind of changes a lot less, like the boom and bust cycle, a lot less extreme and a lot less common. Because the deflationary side, unless maybe we lost like a million Bitcoin all at once publicly and it was proved they were sent to a burned address or something, it's a lot easier for the fiat system to boom and produce trillions of dollars out of nowhere and cause a massive bump in inflation, it's harder for us to have a massive increase in productivity, I think, across sectors that quickly. Maybe in, in one sector, you can have a breakthrough that causes a, a big productivity increase, but it's, I think it's less uh, sudden and, and easy to cause deflationary shocks than inflationary. And overall, it's, it's way better because then the, the free market determines the, the price and not someone uh, in an office deciding what, what, how much money we print and uh, how much we are doing it. That's, that's like, it, it's so ridiculous for me that the whole world looks at like one meeting where some random guy comes on the stage and says like, what, what they cut with the interest rates. Like that's, that seems to be such an arbitrary we, thing to do. We need a new term for it. Like it's a pullet bureau. It's a, we should be using communist terms for this. Like it's central planning. That's what it is. It's, we all bow to these seven gods who tell us how to run our lives. And they look at a bunch of charts and they know what's best for 8 billion people. It's just completely preposterous. It didn't work in the Soviet Union. It hasn't worked in any socialist or communist country of the many types that have been tried. So why would it work in, in this way? It's just central planning done over again with new lipstick on the pig. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin, keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit Bitbox dot swiss slash robin to get your bitbox and the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual you have to 
have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really, really wrong. And through all those steps, the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made an perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. Make sure to check out the link in the description for this amazing Coin Vigilante timepieces. Those watches are amazing. I love them so much. It was really hard for me to pick the one that I want to have because there are a lot of great options. I went with the new transparency edition. They are all limited. Limited. So grab yours. Those will not be available for a long time, but there will come new models and new amazing designs along the way. Yeah, uh, very, very true. It's it's like Bitcoin will bring us to true capitalism and not that uh, weird thing where we have central banks, but everyone calls it capitalism, <laughs> where capital itself isn't uh, free. Uh, it's a it's a it's an interesting uh, interesting time. Uh, what a time to be alive, I would say. <laughs> really, really interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Um, let's talk about what's on your cap with Rite of Passage and Thailand. Uh, first of all, like what is Rite of Passage for those people uh, who don't know about it? So Rite of Passage is uh, essentially a tour and retreat company that I started last year to essentially bring Bitcoiners together and help them bond. So the idea is we do really out there trips where we try to go to places and experiences that are very off the tourist beaten path, try to connect it to Bitcoin in some way. Uh, and they're usually some kind of adventure that gets you out of your comfort zone. So my concept was to bring these two ideas of travel and tourism together, because to me, travel is about, uh, about getting out of your comfort zone and, and kind of breaking your frame for how you see the world. But most people that are traveling, they're tourists, they're tourists. So they're going to the TripAdvisor top 10. They're doing the things that their friends recommended to them or that they read in, in New York Times magazine or whatever. They're, they're doing these things that they think are them traveling, but it's actually built in the tourism industry to be exactly what you expect and what doesn't really challenge you very much and doesn't challenge your way of thinking. But the great thing about Bitcoiners is we are used to having our entire frame of reference smashed because to get Bitcoin, you had to smash your entire mainstream understanding of finance and economics at the very least. And so I want to do that for people through these travel experiences that go very off the beaten path. So what we do right now is mostly motorcycle trips. So I'm doing one in November here in Thailand. I'm doing another one that is for entrepreneurs, not necessarily just Bitcoiners, but entrepreneurs to mastermind and do an adventure together. That one still has available seats and that's at the end of November, also in Thailand. Uh, and I've done retreats. I just did a retreat for Bitcoiners here in Chiang Mai. So I'm trying to come up with these different concepts uh, and different experiences that are really eye-opening and interesting for people. Are really cool. I was open next to it, uh, to the website so people can actually uh see it a little bit uh really cool that, that you're doing it uh, i love that i think that's um that's one of the things that bitcoin are value the most uh and they want to spend like when i look at what bitcoiners want to spend the money on it's high quality uh stuff like high quality food uh high quality experiences high quality whatever it is um it's 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 that the thing where they actually truly value it and that's my hope, uh, as we discussed before, uh, that when everyone is on a sound money standard, that everyone, as you also discussed in the beginning, values uh, the high quality things more and not that, oh, yeah, let's let's go on a cheap, short trip on, on some trip advisor thing that we know, like, oh, yeah, this thing. So it's 
it's I hope that we actually can en enhance that. Um, and you are now also living in, in Thailand uh, and you're from, originally from America, uh, right? Yeah, I grew up outside of Chicago and then I spent seven years in school and working in Philadelphia and New York. And I left New York in the middle of 2019 and came here to Northern Thailand and just fell in love with it and never left. So I've been here since late 2019. I stayed the entire pandemic. I was based here the whole time. The only time I've been outside of Thailand since then for, for more than a week or two was going back to the U.S. to do this motorcycle trip I did in 2022, where it was kind of the, the birth of the ride of passage, really. I went to 30 different Bitcoin meetups all over the U.S., rode a Harley for like 12,000 miles all over the place. Really, really cool. What was the, the, the trigger for you to, to move to, to Thailand and, and uh, why did you do, eventually stay there? So the, the trigger was I was laying in the back of my girlfriend's car and it just hit me like, I got to get out of here. I'm not happy in the U.S. I want to go somewhere else and do something totally different than what I'm doing right now. And at the time I was working online, I was working remote for uh, Bitcoin exchange and they would let me work anywhere in the world. So it's like, fuck it, I'm going to get out of here and just do something that is not being in New York City because that was... I'd been there for about three years and it was becoming abundantly clear to me that in no way is New York my kind of place. And so I had to get out. And the first place I wanted to try was Chiang Mai. I had been there in 2016, but only for like four or five days on a backpacking trip through Southeast Asia. But Thailand in general just struck me as like very different from anywhere that I'd traveled as a kid. And so it, it kind of stuck with me and I thought, you know what? I'm hearing that this place is like a digital nomad hub and it's easy to work from a laptop here and, you know, live a more free life. It's lower cost of living, especially than New York. So I figured let's go try it. And I literally bought a plane ticket and flew out here, not knowing I knew one, knew of one guy that worked in my company and I had no reservations for anything. I just showed up and found a hotel on Google Maps and booked it for a week and just kind of felt it out. And I stayed for 90 days at first to evaluate it. And actually my backup plan was the second place I was going to go is Mexico City. And after that was Amsterdam because those, those two had struck me as well as like very livable places, but I just fell in love with it. And then that took me to early 2020. I went back to South America. I went to Peru and Mexico City for like three, four weeks went to Costa Rica for a company retreat, came back here, processed the paperwork for a visa, for a one-year visa, left and you have to go out of Thailand to get that visa. So I went to Vietnam, picked up the visa, and I left Vietnam when I heard that they were going door to door and temperature checking people and just taking people who had a temperature and nobody knew where they were going. And I was like, okay, I'm going to the airport. So I flew to the airport, I ran to the airport, flew back to Bangkok and got locked in like a few days later. I think I came back to Bangkok on the 12th, the 10th or the 12th or something. And they closed the borders like a couple of days later and didn't open them again for a year. So I was, I was locked in and just had to figure it out from there. Uh, those were crazy times. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's also was kind of a weird, a weird place where there were quite hard rules, but like. 10, 20 percent of the population did not really follow follow the rules, uh, and uh, police was not really any way, shape, or form brutal. So, like they they kind of like um, if you didn't follow the rules in Austria, it was not that bad. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was not uh, the best place <laughs> in the the Dente area to to be, but also not the worst place, I guess. Uh, it was kind of kind of okay. Um, I'm also curious. You you traveled what what is that twelve thousand miles with with the Harley across across America, and you visited uh, Bitcoin meetups and, and and other places. What did you learn about uh, freedom at at, uh, at that uh, trip? And how long how long was that trip? Like this has to be a, a longer trip. Yeah, it was about a hundred days. I think like a hundred and one days total that I was on oh, that man, trip. Like one third of a year, something like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting that you asked the question about freedom because I've been asked a lot about this trip, but no one has asked what I've learned about freedom. And that was actually probably the most interesting learning that I had, especially because I moved to Thailand 
three years before that. And so I kind of got used to Thailand and Thai culture and got to know what Thailand is like. And to me, what really struck me as far as freedom in the U.S. is how not free people are in the land of freedom. Like they, I guess not free is not the right way to put it. The freedoms in America are probably the best in the world as far as your ability to speak your mind, um, your earning potential, like a lot of people and still a lot of ties will flock to the U.S. to to work there to get the protections of being an American and the benefits of being an American. But what I noticed is that people are so generally, not everyone and not in Bitcoin meetups, but outside of Bitcoin meetups, there's so much fear, division, hatred, anxiety that I notice people much more self-defeating, like on that point of freedom, like I moving to Thailand, it kind of solidified for me that I believe freedom is mostly in your mind. If you believe you have the capacity to be free, even if you're in jail or you're objectively not free, that will carry you towards freedom because you'll take the actions that you need to, to be completely free. And I think Bitcoin taught me a lot of that too, that these ideas of sovereignty, they start with you and your personal actions and you taking responsibility for your own life and cultivating that freedom. And what I saw in America is people giving up on that and just crying out for like, please, somebody help me because I don't know what to do or where to turn. And I think that fed a lot of the COVID hysteria on both sides, really. People who who were super anti any health advice that they heard because they just follow one guy on Twitter that posts about whatever he reads on the internet, and that's the health advice that they follow, or they're 100% horse blinders, like whatever the who says, I'm following it. If they want me to inject whatever into my body, I'm yours. There wasn't much like critical thinking or personal responsibility being taken that I saw in the US. Whereas here, the attitude, like they have a lot less, but the people I meet seem much more free because they have what they want and they tend to make peace with that much more than what I saw with Americans. Like they make peace with the circumstances that they're in and they make the best of it. And I did not see that in America. I, I saw people who are, are struggling mostly against themselves. And that was just strange for the place that I grew up in, you know, to have that reflected on me. That's a uh, interesting learning. Uh, really cool. I, I love also how you put it, like the change starts with the individual, the change starts uh, within you. Like uh, I, I see that all the time when people are like, ah, the prices are going up. Yeah, like change starts with you. Adopt Bitcoin. Like don't don't wait till the 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 EU is adopting a Bitcoin standard. This will take a whole lot of time, <laughs> but you can adopt the Bitcoin standard right now. And then all of a sudden inflation is actually your friend and not your enemy. Mm -hmm. uh, so like wh whatever you, you look at, like change, change starts with you, ch starts with, with you as an individual. Uh, and uh, I love that, uh, that, that insight also from you that, um, the America is the best place for freedom, but it seems like the, the people don't feel that free because they, they always want more. And then this is like this unsatisfactory uh, mindset. It's it's an interesting uh, concept to look at. Yeah. Uh, by the way, the 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 whole credits for the questions nowadays goes to ChatGPT. Like they they really, yeah. <laughs> it's 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 really good in finding good questions. Uh, I do a podcast a day, so I was trying to figure out how can I be the most efficient in in finding out what the guest is all about. And it's scary. Like you can really dive in. Like I made a own GPT for that. Uh, and it's trained to do exactly that. Uh, I just put in the name of the guest and it finds me every information that I need uh, and then proposes topics and questions. And they are really thoughtful and really good. And I probably would need at least like three to four uh, research hours for every guest to come up with a similar set of preparation like the questions are wow. still from me but the preparation to the question is is massive like because like i do a podcast every day i cannot research every guest for like three hours that's just impossible for me to time wise but yeah like 
th- those things is just amazing because uh, they, they listen like, oh, you have been traveling that far, you have been meeting on so many uh, things. And then yeah, it's just an obvious question to, to ask because, yeah, a lot of the, the credit I have to go to that TV. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, it's really good at that kind of thing. Like any sort of brainstorming. If you try and get precise answers, it's terrible, but it's terrible and it's very fluffy. But doing brainstorming or getting ideas, like I've used it for questions before, like, kind of doing that research for a conversation it's really good for that even for trips uh, i found it was really interesting if you like just want to find like something uh, like oh i have like a free weekend there what are my options i'm here and then it lists like 20 options for you and you're like oh give me another 20 options and it just like expands your mind a little bit uh, as you would li- really like have to ask a lot of people or like research a lot like it takes up the the first research portion but i think what's dangerous is if we then use it to like decide our lives like we we should yeah. not uh use it to make decisions for us we should uh use it to help us uh in gathering information the same way as we use google uh the the, the, the jump from not having google to google is for me the same jump from like having google to now chat gpt it's, it's it's just like a, a a better way to, to find and gather information uh, and not yeah. make decisions <laughs> based on that. The critical thing is, is it's really critical. Really yeah. cool. Uh, thank you already so much. Um, perfect. Then uh, I, I, I try to ask that every once in a while. Did I forget anything to ask you uh, in what you're doing and, and what you're believing in? Uh, otherwise, I will just move on to the end routine. No, I think we, we covered pretty much everything. Really cool. Um, by the way, uh, not, not that I forget to, to mention it, uh, as I mentioned, it, I think in the beginning, uh, we will be both speaking in Bitcoin Amsterdam. I'm really looking forward to, to the talk. Uh, and, uh, I'm, I'm also looking forward every time because I'm not that much on, on conferences. Uh, but every time I'm there, it's, it's just a pleasure to, to talk to all the guests that have been on the podcast, to all the people that are listening to the podcast, finally meeting in person. So, I'm really looking forward to also meeting some of uh, my audience there and, and the guests. Um, uh, I'm quite pumped about that uh, conference. It's also the first conference that actually uh, moderating a panel. I locked, loved our talk already, so it will be a will be a really cool uh, talk there. Yeah, it's gonna be fun. Perfect. Then first question of the end routine is always the same for every guest. What can we learn from you besides all the things that we already talked about in the podcast? Boy, I guess one thing that I'd like to try to share with people or try to share my passion for is just to let your fears and anxieties down. And this is something that I know because I've dealt with it so much and had to come up with so many ways around it. But like I get asked all the time, especially about moving to Thailand, like how, how could you do that? Like I, I could never do that. People say that. And I think that's the first mistake a lot of people make. And that part of that self-defeat is just saying, I can't do it. Well, you don't know until you've, you've tried or you've taken a couple steps. So that's the first thing is like, it's not impossible to do what you want to do. You should never tell yourself that. Try and figure out what you need to do to get there. My dad always told me when I was a kid that really stuck with me is if there's a will, there's a way. And I kind of thought it was cheesy when I was a kid, but now I a hundred percent believe that if there's a will, there's a way. Uh, I moved to Thailand by buying a plane ticket, then finding where I was going to stay, then getting a scooter, then getting a co-working space. Like everything happens in steps. You don't have to have all the answers before you start. Building a business is even is like that to a thousand. You have no idea what you're doing at the start and nobody does. Like You shouldn't expect yourself to know, but you have to put one foot in front of the other. You can't run a marathon by jumping to the end. You have to you know, take each step on that path. Uh, I don't know. That's just a, a theme that I try to harp on in, in every podcast and every speaking situation where we're talking about anything serious. I, 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 love, I love to, um, uh, addition that a little bit. Uh, I think with, with the podcast story is really cool because I, when I started it, it was just a weird thing that I did on the side. I was like, Oh, okay. Let's, let's interview some, some people. And then just like two months in, uh, I got the first sponsor, uh, and they approached me and I was like, I can make money with that. And then, uh, all of a sudden YouTube also was monetized. All of a sudden Twitter was monetized. It's all like happened in one month. Uh, and then I was like, okay, I get money from that now. So 
I guess I have a startup, even though I did not really had one or wanted one. Uh, and then yeah, I was like, okay, let's, let's jump for it. Like I quit my fear job that was paying good and was treating me good. And my colleagues were amazing. And so like, it was not easy because, uh, the fear job was quite good. Honestly, it, is, it was not like most people are like really disgusted with their fear job, but I wasn't, I actually liked it. Uh, I liked, liked going there. So that's the, 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 the decision to like, just leave that and, and jump into something that I don't know was, uh, was a big one. Uh, but I loved it so much. Like my goal was to, to till the end of the year, interview Michael Saylor. And I had it like in June or something like that. Uh, it's just a few months in the podcast. Uh, I had it no plan that I will be uh, a moderator on a panel, uh, this year. I had it on the plan for next year. It, it happened before, like the approachment and like, Hey, do you want to be moderating a panel? Uh, so like, uh, I think if, if you just do what you really want to do and just let like, go for, for what feels good and, and are not fearful and do a lot of that, like put a lot of energy and work and, and, and energy towards that. And not just like lazy trying to like, oh, I like it. Let's, <laughs> let's figure it out. It's, it's a, not, not take it as an excuse to, to, to watch Netflix uh, all, all day. And then I think uh, a lot of interesting things can happen. And uh, I love that you brought it up. Uh, it gave me a possibility to do also bring that story in the podcast. Really, really thankful for that. Yeah. I, just a quick note on that. I think when I was, was like growing up, I thought that starting a business, like you had to know how to do it and know all the ins and outs of accounting and all this stuff. And I think for certain types of businesses, that's still very true. A lot of physical businesses, because you have to put a bunch of capital into it to buy a store or whatever, you kind of got to know what you're doing or know somebody who you can work with who knows what they're doing with regulation and accounting and payroll and all this stuff. But something like a podcast or even like what I'm doing I before the internet and before all the tools that came on the internet in the last 10 years, maybe this would have been 10, 100 times more difficult, but I have a Squarespace website. I use email. I use Google meet, Google docs, Google sheets, and a cell phone. And that's how I run all this stuff. And now you really can do that. You can have a couple social accounts and a couple software tools for 50 bucks a month. That's probably what it cost me to, to run the actual infrastructure of ride of passage. On top of that is all the research and the time I put into it, but the actual infrastructure is not that expensive. You can take it bite by bite. Whereas 20 years ago, you had to go buy a fleet of motorbikes, buy a store and like really build out the infrastructure before you could accept a single paying customer. It's so much easier to do these things more, uh, in a more agile way where exactly like you said, just follow your passion and see if people are resonating with it and learn and, and pivot and have some failures without losing too much. And eventually you'll find a, a good path. And then comes adding in all that other stuff, creating an entity and learning the legal and, you know, all the stuff that you need to add on top of that. That's crazy. Yeah. Like I never looked at it like that, but because the infrastructure is really cheap to run, it's probably like, I also have like maybe $150 a month for all the software tools that I use as, as it's, it's a lot these days. Uh, but it's like almost nothing compared to what you need otherwise, uh, to, to run something like that. And the other things is like, like microphone and, and lights, but you can do it with your phone also. Like you don't need a microphone for that. Uh, I started with a phone also. It's, 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 it's really fascinating the time that we are alive. And then we also have sound money. Uh, future is bright. Really cool. Perfect. Then, uh, other end routine is where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest is. And I can't believe <laughs> that, that that question, uh, actually got to you. Um, because it's just, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I think sometimes people believe that I select the questions myself, but I actually just get it from the last guest and get it to the next guest. But the question is for you, what has been the best Bitcoin conference you have been so far on and why? <laughs> it's a thing that, like, especially when we talk about, we have been, we're going to Bitcoin Amsterdam and you have been on so many Bitcoin meetups and stuff like that. You're a perfect uh, guest for that. Uh, okay. So this might be specific to me and my life and my experience, but I love the Thailand Bitcoin conference. It's not really well known on the international stage. I think this year they didn't do that much promotion internationally because it's mostly attended by Thais. 
And what I love about it, they did it once last year. It was one day and this year it was two, two days. And it was yeah, like two weeks ago or 10 days ago that I was there. And what I love so much about it is they created content in Thai language for Thai people. And I remember last year, I didn't really know what to expect. And I showed up and there were like maybe, I think there were 800 or 900 tickets sold and they had planned to sell 200. So they had to keep opening more and more and more. And when I got there, I realized like there's maybe 150, 200 foreigners here, foreigners living in Thailand, but also like people from Southeast Asia that came into Thailand for the trip and for the conference. And the rest were like mostly middle-aged Thai people who were like trying to figure out what is this thing. And they weren't, as far as I could tell, like shit coiners or ICO promoter kind of people. They were like professional Thai people that were interested in how Bitcoin works. They wanted to learn about mining. They wanted to learn about the market and exchanges and everything. And this year, I saw that there really is a, a vibrant Bitcoin community here of Thai people. It's just not well known because everything they do is very Thai. Like it's all in Thai language. They have a discord of like 5,000 plus people that are talking about Bitcoin all day long, all different aspects of it. There's channels for everything imaginable. Imagine, I don't know the word for that, but anything you can imagine along with Bitcoin. And there's like fiat food as a channel in there. It's like, it's, you would recognize it as a Bitcoiner outside of Thailand, but it's all in Thai, it's all for Thai people. And I think a lot of that, we have to thank this company, Right Shift, and the founder of it, Perea, who created a lot of YouTube videos and did basically exactly what you did. Like a lot of interviews and a lot of just him talking to the camera about Bitcoin and different aspects of it. He helped translate the Bitcoin standard and the fiat standard, which are now best-selling books in Thailand, into Thai and created all this content. And it's just amassed this massive following of Thai people that I don't think would have gone into Bitcoin if they had only read English content. There's certainly a lot of Thais that can read English content. Uh, but especially when you get into Bitcoin, it gets very technical and whatnot. It's better to have it in Thai. And I, I just love that conference because it brings out that Thai community into one place and you get to meet Thais that are also really down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. And you might have had nothing else in common or ever come across this person, but now you have Bitcoin. Really, really cool. Uh, I just checked it out uh, next to it. Uh, and there was like just like a few, I think two or three people that I actually know from the speakers. It's, it's like it's, it seems to be really Thai focused. Uh, mm -hmm. I love that. Like once, I, once I'm in Thai, but I, they're only speaking Thai. So as, as someone that doesn't know, in, uh, only knows English, they cannot understand it, right? So the last year it was mostly English content. This year it was like 50, 50, like I did a talk and it was all in English, but they have live translation. So they have, it, it worked kind of on and off depending on who the speaker was and how clearly or how quickly they spoke, but they had live translation from Thai back into English and from English into Thai. So you really could attend all of it, whether you only spoke one language or the other. Very really cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, Thailand, I definitely want to check it out, uh, at some point. So maybe I will overlay that with the, the, the Thai conference. I think September it was this year, right? Yeah. I don't know if they're going to do it next year though. I think like they're kind of trading around with the other Southeast Asian countries. So maybe Vietnam or I know Indonesia is going to do theirs next year. They took this year off. So they're kind of hopping around. So I may be at Indonesia next year. Yeah, let's see. Really cool. Thank you so much already for uh, uh, even uh, Evan. <laughs> still have a problem. <laughs> still want to say even and not Evan. Uh, thank you so much, Evan, for, for being on the show. Uh, where can people find you, ask your questions uh, and see more about you? Uh, so the Ride of Passage website, which is rideofpassage.live. That's a good place. You can find all my accounts on there. And my Twitter account is, it's in the, the Riverside caption thing. It's at Captain Sid, S I D D with two D's. And if you DM me on, on Twitter, that's probably the best place to start. If you got any questions. Yeah. People will not see it on screen, but they can see your Twitter account in any description, wherever they are listening to on YouTube, Spotify, wherever they are on, if they're listening on, on Twitter, I know they're like, 10, 20 people that actually listen to the whole podcast <laughs> on, on Twitter. 
uh, not just the first 30 seconds, then most, uh, they, they can just go to the, to the Twitter handle linked above. Uh, so Twitter is always linked uh, and uh, the, the best website also perfect. And thank you so much uh, for being on the show. Uh, also, thank you so much for everyone that is watching and listening uh, um, for joining us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow for another episode. Bye-bye. Awesome. Thanks, Ronald.